Well, my name is Josh Gray. I get the privilege of being the lead servant here at this church, and I am so excited to be able to share with you today uh, what we're going to talk about. I'm a little nervous about next week already, but today I'm feeling pretty good, so you never know what that means. Um, a couple of things I want to address up front here. I want to welcome all of those of you watching online. I want to give a shout out. I heard someone was watching uh, from uh, Sun Valley. And so I just want to say hello. We know that you're there. We're super excited. Check in online if you're there. You know who else is watching us online today right now? Our children's pastor, Laura. And Laura is watching online probably from a hospital bed in, uh, in Spokane. And so Toby just came up to me and and said that she's watching. And so I want to give our family update. Laura was in a pretty uh, not great ATV accident. Uh, and she was in, it was not great enough that uh, she got fl flown, right, Toby? She got flown, life flighted up to Spokane. And praise God, she is able to watch us uh, online today. And your people are doing great, Laura. I know you're worried about what's going on in children's ministry because that's who you are. <laughs> your people are doing great. Um, but it was bad. This is a bad deal. She was in ICU and had surgery and all those things. And so there's a road of recovery. Um, I know Toby said that he's had a great outpouring of help uh, from the church. And we will continue to do that, Toby, with your family and what's going on. But uh, I want to stop. and I want us to all pray specifically for Laura. I also want to pray uh, on Thursday, one of our, our neighbor tenants here, um, I was walking out of my, our elder meeting and a lady came running. She's like, where's the AED? Where's the AED? Uh, and so I ran in here and found it and brought it over and ran over to those things and was kind of ripping the pads off. And then I was like, ah, I don't remember what I'm doing. I went to this training once and then thank goodness somebody that knew what they were doing came in there. Um, but one of our guys was uh, administering CPR uh, to this gentleman and he, uh, uh, he's a faithful, uh, our guy is a faithful servant here at this church. And uh, all the law enforcement folks came in, and as far as I know right now, he's, he's alive. Um, right now, I don't have any other updates, but he's alive. But he was not great for a long time. And so uh, I'm really proud of, of, of our guy who was loving on him well. And I'm really proud of our, uh, our first responders. Our police officers came quickly, and they were there doing a great job. And then our paramedics came, and they were doing it. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. And we got to stand there and pray and ask for God's hand upon him. Um, but... Man, thank you so much for our first responders and all those folks and the work that they do. They were it's beyond professional and really, really excellent. And so I'm super grateful. So I want to pray uh, specifically uh, for for those for Laura and for this other gentleman as well. But I want us to like I want us to to like get serious about it. We're gonna get serious about this prayer right now. We're not just like, hey, could you help out, God? No, this is His people pleading and asking for the creator of the universe to intervene into someone's life, uh, medically, spiritually, all of those things. And so I wanna pray for, for, for Laura and this other gentleman right now as a church. So uh, let's take a moment, take a deep breath. Whew. All right, Father God, we come to you united as believers. And Father God, we just ask in a mighty, mighty way, in a humble humble but bold and confident way because we know who you are. We know what you do. You speak the world into existence. You speak things into existence, Father God. You have the ultimate power. Your words are the ultimate power and authority. You have dominion over us and over this place. You help us, Father God. I ask that you would just come and fall upon Laura right now, right where she's sitting. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prayers coming, Father, to you right now. We ask that you would just give Laura peace, that she would just feel an overwhelming amount of peace, that you would heal her miraculously. We praise you for the medical workers that were already there doing all of that stuff, Lord. We just lift her up to you. You know who she is. You know her heart. You know how she loves you and how she loves her, her family and how she loves this family and how she loves the children, Lord. I ask for healing. I ask for healing for her physically. I ask her healing for her emotionally in the future and all those things that you would just be with her in a mighty, mighty way. I also lift up the other gentleman, Lord. I don't know his situation, but I know he's in Kootenai Medical Center. I know that, that, that you didn't let him go that particular day, and I ask for your hand upon him as well, Lord, that he would know who you are. I ask that he would, he would be uh, revived. I ask that he would have had an experience with you, Lord, 
in a mighty powerful way. So we just lift these folks up to you. There is no doubt who you are and what you can do. Please, please, Father God, intervene in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, here we are, Corinthians chapter 6. We're moving on. I know if you've been reading in Corinthians chapter 6, you're probably like, all right, well, here we go. This is going to be exciting. And as we move into the moving on, we're like, okay, I wonder how they're going to handle this. I wonder how they're going to deal with this. And so as we dive into this, these are real people in a real place at a real time with real issues. Not unlike ourselves. And the Apostle Paul is coming to them and he's talking to this church and he's trying to give godly counsel and wisdom to help them follow the Lord in a mighty, mighty way. I want you to think about this theme for this message. And I want you to repeat this uh, with me uh, after I say it here. The story I'm telling myself is. The story I'm telling myself is. One more time. The story I'm telling myself is. I want you to think about that as we work our way through this message. Because how many of us in here are great storytellers? Like a couple? I would beg to differ. I would say that you are all excellent storytellers. Some of you don't say it out of your mouth, but you tell stories in your head. You tell stories in your head and you tell them so well that you believe them whether they're truthful or not. And so the story that I'm telling myself is, is the theme I want you to be thinking about as we go through God's word here in this message. So remember, um, the, 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 one of the things that was hitting me as I was studying this this week was the kingdom of heaven idea again. It comes often, and I see this uh, in the text. We'll hear a couple of like the kingdom of, of God pieces of these things. And so think about this. In order to have a kingdom, what do you need to have? A king, right? And kings have edicts and rules and regulation. We have local kings and we have, we have, uh, we have a, you know, in our little world, we have a governor and we have a lieutenant governor who are doing great together. Um, and <laughs> they say, whoa, this is like the crown. Look at this. Ooh. Um, and then we have, you know, we have, uh, we have senators and we have, we have, you know, we have a, we have a, in a sense, a king, a kingdom. We have, there's certain rules and things that we obey, obey by. There's a couple documents that are pretty foundational to how we function and act as Americans. Uh, one would be the Constitution, one would be the Bill of Rights, right? Those are things that were put there. So we kind of have this, the king, the king, there's a king, and there's rules that this kingdom lives by. Well, the word, uh, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, is used over 200 times, uh, mostly by Jesus in the text. So he talks about kingdom a lot, so a king sets the rules in the kingdom. In the kingdom that God created, that he has created us to be a part of, has guidelines and values and boundaries. So what are the guidelines and values and boundaries that God left for us to think about? Well, he gave us a little more than the Constitution. He gave us a little more than the Bill of Rights. He gave, us, he gave us 66 books by 40 inspired authors that are divine about how to live. And he's telling a story in here. He's telling a story about his creation and how his creation should maybe treat each other and how his creation should, should look to him. And so as Christians, we would hold this. Remember, we're inside of the church. We just got done with that. Like this is a value system that we have. How well do we know our value system? How well do we interpret this? How do you read this? And so this is our constitution. If you call yourself a Christian, you know, this, this is, the, this is the, the front piece. If you call yourself, how about this? A follower of Christ. We can name ourselves Christians a lot, right? I am a this. But because we call ourselves that doesn't mean that we are. When you follow Christ, you become a Christian. You are a follower of Christ, they reflect, this reflects what God's character is like, what his nature is like. And obviously, this book currently differs with some of our current ruling kings on this earth, doesn't it? And how things are viewed and how we should act towards certain things. So I want to think about what is Paul getting at here? God's rules lead to shalom, which is peace. They lead to wholeness. They lead to, to proper justice. 
They lead to righteousness, living out God's plan. His rules lead to that. So let's dive in. What is Paul saying here in the first part of Corinthians chapter 6? Let's dive in here. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Lawsuits among believers is how it was titled in my Bible. Here we go. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment? Let's pause right there. You, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment? Who are you taking your disputes to, Christians? Do you not already have a king who can help with your disputes? Why would you not turn to him? Why would you not turn to the gospel? Well, how come? Why wouldn't they do that? Well, they're not used to doing things God's way. Remember, this is like a couple years later, he's writing a letter back. And when I think of Corinthians, I'm like, this is like a church of thousands. And like half the people in Corinth are believers. No. This might have been a church of 100 or 150, 200 people in a church that has, in a, in a city that has 10,000 prostitutes. This is a, a group of people, and they're new believers. So their old ways are still in them. And if you know anything about the Roman court system and the Roman court, this was like entertainment. People would be judged in front of hundreds of people. You would be judged, and there would be rulings, and you would take them, and it was like, oh, hey, there's a judgment coming, coming on. Everybody, East, Gate, East City Park, let's go. There's a giant judgment coming, and there would be four, five, six, seven hundred of us going like, okay, what's going to happen to this person? Oh, he's going, to be, he's going to be crucified. All right, well, get the popcorn. Like it was a big deal. It was part of who they were. It's part of their character. So why are they falling back to what they know? So he goes on to say, he says, so, so why are you taking this before the uh, ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not have confidence in what I taught you, he said? Do we have confidence in this? Do you not know that we will judge angels? You are the people who God will one day entrust to, to judge the task of judging the world, but you're taking your stuff before the world? This little stuff, trivial stuff? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those people whose way of life is scorned in the church? Why are you taking your stuff in front of this? Why are you used to doing that? I say this to shame you. That's pretty strong words. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Is there no one that understands what he spent the time teaching them about who God was? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. Remember my forehead moment when I heard my forehead last week? This is Paul like, and this in front of unbelievers. Why is he so concerned about what we're doing in front of unbelievers? The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your very own brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Whose king are we trying to be? Who, which kingdom are we trying to be a part of? My kingdom? Till my kingdom comes? Till my will be done? Till my, everything happens for me on earth? What's, what's, what am I owed? Do not be deceived. Warning, warning, warning lights going off. You have a car warning lights, like your engine blows up and like the lights just go nuts and crazy. Like he's like, do not be deceived. Warning, 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 warning. Pay attention, pay attention, church. Don't be deceived. This is a matter of life and death. Eternal separation for all who choose not to live under the king's guidelines and rules. 
goes on to say, neither the sexually immoral nor the adulterers, nor the adulterers, nor the men who have sex with men, nor the thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanders, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to get to more of that next week. And that is what some of you were. Wait a minute. Some of you people were all of these things he just listed? Yeah, they were. That's what you were. And then Paul's like, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And because that's what you were, you should look and act and function different than the rest of the world. Because you have something that the rest of the world doesn't have, which is the very Spirit of God who came and dwelled inside of you when you accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You are different. You're not, you're not better. It's not a matter of better, or less, or better. But you should be different. You should react to things differently. Paul, is he not claiming this every time he talks about the temple? We've been like, I was going through this. I'm like, okay, here, is this another temple message? Is this another thing about how we're looking to the rest of the world? Yes, it is. Well, I guess he had to talk about it a bunch of times. Maybe we should too. How are we being viewed by the rest of the world? Are we taking all of our disputes out into the world to be handled? Because I don't get a lot of calls for biblical conflict resolution. And we have 640 or 650 people that call this church home every weekend. I'm not saying maybe you guys are great at it. Maybe you don't need, need the pastor for that stuff. Maybe you don't need our elders for that stuff. But like we're here and we're working on it as well. So, but now you are different and we need to look different from the rest of the world so we can show the world what just a just righteous king looks like. So you think about these lawsuits, they're disagreements from brother to brother. In God's kingdom, how we're to handle our disagreements as followers of Christ looks different. So now let me, let me clarify something here. We do have laws in our lands, obviously, right? And when we're talking about abuse, physical, sexual, mental abuse, all of those things that are happening, and like you, like, well, I'm a believer. I'm going to just handle this inside. Like there are some things I would like to handle after I've heard some of the stories from our ladies up here on CR. I would like to handle some things that aren't very Christian because I got pretty frustrated and pretty angry that a man would ever treat a woman that way. And there's something inside of me that boils up that wants to fight and turn their other cheek. But the Lord has his judgment. So there's, I want to clarify like, well, just keep it all within the church because the church has handled conflict so well all the time. Like we have a lot of bad examples, but we're working on that. So when it's abuse and it's these major things, you're supposed to, you're supposed to report those things to the authorities that are over, over us. But we're talking about, and a lot of times, is that every conflict? Is it always that? No. Is like 90% of our conflicts not need to be, do you call your, do you call the police every time you have a conflict with your spouse? No. So, like, there's a bunch of stuff we can handle in the church, and are we handling it in the church? So conflict is unavoidable. As we're all bound by a little bit of our sinful nature. And it's, it's, it's not necessarily uh, uh, bad, but when it's dealt with poorly, you know what it does that breaks God's heart? It severs relationships. Have you had people that have been just estranged and they won't talk to a family member for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years? They'll lose an entire lifetime because they don't want to handle conflict. That does not bring shalom to the family. The story I'm telling myself is, oftentimes I will resolve a conflict in my own head and not verbally face to face and work it out. Carrie has worked with this for 25 years with me. It's been unfair. It's been unfair to you. Because I feel like we've moved on. She's like, you keep such a short record of accounts. Yeah, because the story I'm telling myself is, and what I do is I hide underneath the thought process that I'm in, well, I'm an internal processor. Well, that's great, but that process needs to come out for people to have resolution. When I tell the story in my own head, I don't bring others along. 
and resolution. And I don't bring others along to help me understand if the story that I'm telling myself is accurate. Have you ever convinced yourself because you told the story to yourself over and over again and it was the wrong story? Anybody ever done that? Yeah. So we should be the best at conflict resolution as Christians. The church should be a place where the world would come into to get good advice about conflict resolution. So I want us to give us some practical pieces when we talk about conflict resolution that we can use. And, and there was a ton of things that we're trying to equip our staff and all of you with uh, that you could take advantage of. And so a couple things. Remember, the story I'm telling myself is. So a couple things. Give people the benefit of the doubt first. Don't find them guilty and build up in your mind what they already think and are already going to say because of past habits or past arguments you either have or haven't had with them and make the judgment yourself. Actually give people the benefit of the doubt. And when you give people the benefit of the doubt, you give the Holy Spirit the benefit of the doubt in their heart and in their mind to convict and change them or convict and change you. So how about starting there giving people the benefit of the doubt? Assume... The person has the best of intentions. Why? Well, because the story I'm telling myself is maybe they don't have the best of intentions and I'm telling myself that story over and over again. Maybe it's not accurate. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Assume that they have the best of, attention, of intentions. And understand that people are generally pretty smart. God gave you a pretty amazing three and a half pound brain. And people can see things and do, they're, they're, they're generally pretty smart, right? And so we assume and say, because they don't agree with what I say, which you're going to have plenty of opportunity in the next couple of weeks, that, oh, they don't agree with, if you don't agree with what I say, then you are wrong or incorrect or not. Do you think possibly there could be more than one viewpoint on a subject? Do you think that would be healthy to work that out and talk about it in community? Or should we just stand back and start throwing rocks? And if we kill enough people that have the other viewpoint, then we don't have to listen to their viewpoint. Verbally, spiritually, physically. I don't think that's what we're called to do. So a couple tips. Seems like an applicational me message, right? Resolve conflict quickly and safely. I added safely on there. Well, just go back to that abusive situation. Just walk in there and just, you know, I know it was only a couple knives and, and guns and bats. No, don't do that. But resolve your conflict quickly and safely, right? Like how much baggage do we want to carry on with us? Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift in front of the altar. Don't, 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 don't take it into the altar. If you're not right, first go be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Here's what I want you to think about this. Don't think that you can have an awesome relationship with God but drag around a truck full of bitterness and unresolved conflict in your life. Don't think that you can have an awesome relationship with God and drag around a truck full of bitterness and unresolved conflict in your life. That relationship in my mind will be incomplete. That will be incomplete. So do it quickly. Ephesians 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by uh, it's deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude with your minds. And you're to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, because we are not that way anymore, because that's not who we are anymore. Paul continues to talk about the newness of who you are when you accepted the gospel. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. And in your uh, anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still, still angry or the devil will get a foothold. If you're holding on to anger and bitterness from a long time, you've given the devil a foothold in your life. 
and we are to give him no footholds. He has no authority, no power in our lives. Not a single foothold. Therefore, what happens when you, go, when you let the sun go down in your anger day after day? Do you think day after day it just kind of goes away? Just fades you. Time will heal all wounds is one of the biggest lies we've ever heard. Time does not heal all wounds. It buries it. It buries it and let it, lets it fester and infect the rest of the wounds and infect everything else. Time does not heal all wounds. Well, I don't want to bring it up because, well, okay, you just pack it around. Enjoy the heaviness. Second thing, face-to-face whenever possible. I am about losing my mind with uh, Facebook and text and uh, these email reconciliation stuff. Sorry. Oh, okay, well, we're good. He said he was sorry in the email. No. I actually think the mask stuff, I, you know what I think? I think people will, even when we're not in need of wearing masks at all, I think people will still wear masks because you can hide. You can hide. You can hide your emotions. You can hide lots of things. And we lose so much. If you only get to see this much of me, you know how much you get to see when I send you a text message? That much of me. You just get words. And you, are words in a text message easily misinterpreted? Do they have any heart behind them? Do they have any, like, well, you can emoji the stuffing out of them. I put a smile emoji on there. They knew I was joking. No, 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 no. The window or the eyes to the soul or the, what is it? Windows, eyes, soul. The window to the soul. Yeah. Like looking in somebody's big hairy eyeball and having a discussion with them and letting them see your heart and your emotions and where you're at. That's a good way to resolve conflict. Now don't do it unsafely. If you need to bring another brother or sister there, you do that. But do it face to face. Slow down on the text message apologies. If you can't do it face to face, do it voice to voice. Third thing I want you to think about as we resolve conflicts and do it well, be careful when you chat with others before you chat with the person you have a conflict with. I'm just processing. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of everything that I'm telling you, just so you know. I do not stand up here in a glass house. I'm just processing. Well, how many people do you got to process with? Gossip is merely getting your own version out, getting your own version out there before the other person can tell theirs. Restoration begins when a brother or sister that you're in conflict with, that's when it begins when you're meeting with them, not with those on the sidelines. You can have wise counsel. Talk to a person that is one of your wise counselors that you feel is mature in the Lord and say, hey, I'm having this struggle with this person. This is, I'm going to talk to him. I promise. This is how I'm thinking about approaching it. Do you have any suggestions? And every one of you, when somebody says they just wanted to process with you, it is now you are now accountable to make sure that they go have that discussion. Just so you know. <laughs> Well, I just processing. Well, good. If you want to process with me, we're gonna we, like. I hope you know that we're processing this conflict to 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 a discussion, because otherwise, I just became a part of gossip. Now, I could say that Randy could be processing. Man, Randy, you are so far out of bounds. I think you owe that person an apology, and that is absolutely not like godly what you're doing at all. And you should go talk to them about that and apologize to them. Well, that's not really what I was thinking you were gonna say. Let me process with somebody else because obviously <laughs> that information is not accurate. No, no, no. No, we have, to, we have to be better at that. Restoration begins with the brother or sister you're in conflict with, not with the person that you're processing with. Fourth thing I want you to think about, you can always, uh, if, when, if you can't work it out and you've done the face-to-face thing and you've, and you've gone that, you can seek a mediator. And in a church, you have elders, you have pastors in your life group, you have your life group leader, you have other people that you're doing life with. You go with them, not as like we're teaming up on you, but a mediator is somebody who's going to sit in that conflict and be like, I want to hear this side. I've used this with, uh, with one of my, our elders. I was uh, in a conflict with the staff. With I don't know if I was in a conflict, but I needed to get clarity, and I wasn't communicating clearly. Shocker. And so uh, I went and sat with the staff member, had an elder there who was just there to listen, and me. And it was like, 
and we talked like 99% of the time, and then at the end we're like, Dennis, what did you hear us say? And he, and he was able to give clarity to some things that we heard, and it was good for us to do that. So we, we used the biblical concept of uh, resolving conflict because we brought in a mediator. And so if you don't have relationships that are awesome enough here at this church to have a mediator, then get in a life group. Come talk to me. Come talk to our elders. Come talk to our staff because we are here to resolve conflict. And why do we want to resolve conflict? Because broken relationship leads to division. And division hurts the church. Satan is here to kill, to steal, to destroy. And he would like nothing else to do that but in your mind with the story that you're telling yourself is. He wants to get in there and tell a different story. A biblical concept of peace among one another occurs 550 times in the text. They talk about it 550 times about peace between one another. God is here to bring peace. And if his people don't know how to bring peace within their own building, how in the world are we going to model it outside? Remember, the temple is all y'all, all of us, right, collectively. So do everything you can to live within unity. Love your neighbor, turn the other cheek. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Forgive quickly, love well. So that what? Why do we want to do that? That you may be the light to the world this way that Jesus will be glorified. God will bring conviction. How many of you have some healing and restoration that you need in your life? I do. I do. And I got to do the hard work of conflict resolution. Or I'm not a f I'm not necessarily a follower of Christ. Heaven's rules will always lead to peace. Jesus Christ said it himself, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another and you don't love somebody by, by dragging around baggage forever. And so we have classes, just so you know. Restoration night is awesome. I don't know why it's not stuffed to the brims every Thursday night with people there because we have great testimonies. We heard a, a, a testimony this week that was, wow, wow. And what God is doing in that person's life. Restoration night is awesome. So what, here's what happens on restoration night. We have classes like, oh, like unless you're an, if you're an expert in conflict management and you like have all kinds of degrees and certificates on that, I'd love to talk to you about this so we can do some more teaching here uh, on this topic. But we are doing that. So like Carrie taught a class resolving uh, everyday conflicts. And there's like 25 people in that class and it was in this room. Right now, her and Sarah uh, are teaching a class about boundaries. And how do you have boundaries? Boundaries help with conflicts knowing what your boundaries are. What are healthy boundaries? We have those things. Like we're providing all of these resources that are available and you know how much we're charging to do it? Nothing, your tithe. Like we're providing all of these resources for us to be better at handling conflict, for us to be better at understanding boundaries. And they're there for you to take it. We are to equip the saints and we wanna equip you with that. And so as we go into communion here, get your communion elements ready. We'll have uh, some... Uh, folks walking down, if you didn't get that, we have an open table. If you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we are excited that we get to participate in this with you. If you need it, they'll get you some. But I want you to just think about this. I want you to let this sit. Some of you might not be able to take communion today. Some of you might not be able to take communion today because if you have ought against a brother or sister, there's something that you haven't gotten resolved, you should leave your sacrifice at the table or at the altar. You've unfortunately had to see me do that a couple times up here by myself, where I was like, I am not right with somebody, so I'm gonna just lead the body through communion, but I don't get to participate. And you know what I, you know what I wanted to do next week? I wanted to participate in the offering. And so I was pretty motivated to try, go and try and get that right with somebody. I would be thrilled if after this service, if people were staying and praying and that we were working out any conflicts, anything that we would have in here, you work it out. 
Because if we can't work it out in here, what do you think the odds are of us working it out out there? Not high. We pay people millions of dollars to work out our conflicts called lawyers. So I want us to come to the, to, to the table with that mindset. Don't, don't drag your bitterness. Don't drag your stuff. Clean it up. Walk free. Because that's how we're designed. We're designed to do that. So let's pray. Father God, I just ask for your hand upon everyone in here. As we go into some exciting topics that are in the future that we may disagree with each other on or disagree with you on or disagree with the viewpoint on it, that we wouldn't just cut bait and leave because we disagree. That we would be mature disciples, that we would want to have discussions. We would seek to understand the other person's viewpoint. We would assume, we would assume the good things. We would assume that people are smart. We will assume that people uh, have put time and energy and effort on that. We will be careful with the story that we tell ourselves in our heads because we want to tell your story and we want to tell it well. So God, I just ask you would just infuse this church with your Holy Spirit, that it would be upon us, that we would be a conflict-resolving church that we would not be broken up and divided by Satan's schemes to get into a church and mess it up, to have brother fighting against brother and sister fighting against sister, that we would grow through that, that we would use your set of rules, we would use your kingdom guidelines to the best of our abilities to draw closer to each other as we resolve conflict and to glorify you. You gave us the perfect sacrifice. Jesus modeled what it looked like. He gave us the words on how to live a godly life to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, Father, I ask that you just not let conflict hang around our church. We're not interested in giving the devil a foothold anywhere in this church. So, Lord, move us towards resolution. Lord, use the, thanks for letting us use the tools that you've provided other awesome believers to develop so we can understand boundaries and conflict resolution and, and study it, not just read a book, but live it. So, Father God, I ask you to break that foothold in this church. There is no, there is no conflicts that we're not going to fix. There is no conflicts that we're not going to fight for, to, 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 to work together for, to be humble when we on occasion are approved, are, are correct, that we're, that we're humble in our correctness, that we're meek when we're wrong. So I just ask you to just have your hand upon us in a mighty, mighty way as we come to the table. So the Lord Jesus, on that night, he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember Let's remember. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant. We're made new. It is in his blood to do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And when we proclaim his death, we proclaim his ways. And when we proclaim his ways, we are changed people. Let's be changed people. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this word. I ask that you just be moving mightily amongst the hearts here. That you would help us search, dig deep, do some inventory, do some homework. Mind my heart, Lord, where am I carrying around baggage that you do not want me to carry around? Don't let us be heavy carrying around baggage. Let us seek reconciliation in a mighty, mighty, powerful way. Help us to be great modelers of that in Jesus' name. Amen.